We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to wrestle with your word this morning. And Lord, I thank you for these questions. Because, Lord, each one of these questions represent wrestling. It represents engaging your word. And I pray that you would uh, just help us to engage your word this morning. Father, we don't hold all the answers, but you do. And, uh, Lord, help us to, to, give the, to, to give a reasonable answer to the questions that have been given. May I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So the first question um, that was asked, and I'm going to read it the best I can, said, in ancient times, pagans would cut down trees, decorate them with silver and lay presents under them as gifts uh, for the spirit of the tree or some other nature god. Uh, nature god. Uh, this is addressed in Jeremiah 10.1. We'll deal with that. And I thought I saw it once in the New Testament. Is it there? Uh, if so, where? I can't find it right now. So the... First of all, we're going to break this question apart. Um, so the question is, if I was to paraphrase this, they're asking about the validity of a Christmas tree and Christians celebrating Christmas with a Christmas tree. And uh, we know that the solstice was a pagan uh, holiday and there was stuff there. Um, I was, actually, I thought it was interesting, Fox News over, over December uh, had the same question. Uh, and they decided to do some research. And these are, I believe, non-Christians that were endeavoring to find out the history of the Christmas tree it's, itself. And uh, the story goes as this for Christian, the Christmas tree. Its story comes from Martin Luther, who was the reformer. And as the story goes in history, is one day he was out, uh, he, was, he was wandering, and the snow was on the ground, and the trees were up. And, and, and he looked up, and through this one tree... He saw stars shining through it, and he got an idea. So he cut the tree down, took it out, and he began to decorate it. Now, when he began to establish that as a tradition for Christmas and for the coming of Christ, uh, he actually, each part of the tree had a scriptural purpose in what he did. Uh, the tree, double John 15, uh, if you remember, uh, Jesus said, I am the true vine. And, and uh, my father is, you know, the gardener. And so, you know, we look at the root as Jesus. He's the true vine. And the branches are us, if you will. And so Martin Luther kind of established that as a theme. And then the lights on the tree that were, that were, were candles at that time, which caused many fires. And that was one of the things Fox News talked about, how many people died uh, on this tradition uh, because of fires. But uh, they had fire. Had to do, had really had, again, was focused on Scripture and was focused on Jesus being the light of the world and, and the light of that. The ornaments that were put on the tree has to do with the fruit, the fruit and the gifts uh, of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit that was there. So there was actually with the Christmas tree traditional that we hold to as Judeo-Christians, that comes from that tradition. Now people will come and say, well, there's another tradition out there, and, and, and so is this, you know, taken. Now they, they reference Jeremiah 10, and, and, uh, and we can read Jeremiah 10, 1, uh, but I will let you know this has nothing to do with Christmas trees, this has to do with idol worship. And building idols, and that that would pose a, a more fair question: is is are we putting trees up, and are we are we worshiping them? Are we holding them? Are we worshiping them, or are they an instruments of our worship? And I think that really what it comes down to. Now, I'm pretty liberal when it comes to Christmas. I celebrate it. My purpose is this: anytime people are going to lift up Jesus and celebrate anything to them, I'm in that party. Okay, I don't care what you know, what, you know says. Well, what about solstice in this background? Well, Paul said it probably best in Corinthians when he said this, uh, everything is permissible, but not everything is profitable. Right. And he, he was attacked, dealing with legalism that was coming into the Jews, the Juda Judaisms, that was dealing with the fact of how do you uh, deal with meat that was sacrificed to idols? So that's pretty comparable. Right. You had this meat in the yards, and we've had this conversation before, back in the time of Paul in the early church, if you went to the, especially in the Roman culture, Romans would build basements in their, in their dwellings. And their dwellings, their basements would have altars to every god that they would know. And they, they, so, you know, if you were a happening Roman, if you were like a hip Roman, okay, you probably had 10 or 20 gods that you would worship. And many of those gods required sacrifice and meats that would lay before them. Kind of like if you've gone into an Asian restaurant and seen Buddha and people will put a, a piece of fruit in front of Buddha. There's a worship to that god. But they would have little altars established and, and, and made. And so, and so they would go to the, uh, a lot of these were wealthy people, they would go to the, the marketplace and they would buy fresh meat that was, you know, the expensive meat. You know, it was, it was $5 a pound or $6 a pound. They would take it home. And they would worship, they would basically put it in front of their, their altars for a day. When they got done with it, they've learned that, you know, actually it wasn't very profitable to throw it away. 
and they didn't need it because it wasn't meat they used, so they would get new meat. So they would sell it back to the marketplace at a very discount rate, so it would actually they would get up, come up, come ahead. The market, what they would do is take that meat, clean it up, refresh it, reseason if they needed to, and stick it back out there. <coughs> and they would sell it for half price or a tenth of what the room cost. So you have these people going in, they're hungry. How many know you want, you know, sometimes you can afford a Big Mac, but you really want a steak, right? You know? Yeah. And, and so they would go and they would buy what they could afford. And so this became a huge contention in the church of that day because it was like, well, is it right for you to take meat home that was sacrificed to some god? And are you somehow, are you somehow uh, missing the point here? And that was the argument. It was the same argument as Christmas in a lot of ways. And, and Paul's argument was this. I can really care where that meat's been as long as it's clean. As long as it's okay and it's, 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 it's edible, I'm not going to really worry because I don't use it as worship to that god. <coughs> as I pray, I give my God the things for what is there. So he talks about what's called weak faith and strong faith. And he says, he says some people have a weaker faith, <coughs> which means they're more insecure in their faith. And that whole issue comes down to Paul. That's where he says, listen, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to, if you struggle with meat that has been, uh, that has been <coughs> sacrificed to idols, and I've cleaned it up and washed it, I'm not going to invite you over for dinner and serve you that meat. That would be wrong. Paul basically says that's wrong because I, I'm basically, I, I, I'm judging you in that process. For me, when I'm home alone, I eat the meat. I could care less. But if you're going to come over and that may be an issue for you, I'm going to go buy the expensive stuff, the fresh stuff, so we don't have a problem. I, I think, and that's where he comes up, everything's permissible but not everything's profitable. And I think some of these issues that people want to make an issue with the gifts and, and, and Christmas I don't know. I, I uh, personally, I love Christmas. I love to celebrate Christmas. I think uh, it's a great time uh, of a holiday. It's a great thing for Christ's coming. Is it as important of a holiday as Easter? Probably not. Uh, but uh, but Jesus is being lifted up, and I love it when I hear atheists say Merry Christmas. I, I'm like, this is you know, you know what that name says? Christ. Christ is in the middle of that. And, and I know some people think that they don't realize that you know. I think culturally today, I've even had this conversation in my own home. Uh, people might say, well, you know, Christmas doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. And I think we live in a generation that actually believes that. But, uh, uh, but I think we, we live in a culture that wants to see that, Christmas without Christ. But as far as I'm concerned, is Christ is the very center of everything I do, and it's the center of my worship. So I don't know. I, don't know if, I have no idea if that answered that question or endeavored it. There is nothing in the New Testament that says that Christmas trees are wrong. <laughs> Um, that's not there. The Jeremiah passage here, ten one, it talks about them cutting a tree in the forest, but it's talking about making idols. It's creating idols. It's not talking about putting up a celebrating Christmas with that. Um, and so, I don't know. Is there anything else? No, I, I think it goes back to the heart of the conversation. Because if you're if you're really looking at, oh, should we celebrate this? Should we celebrate that? There's tons of stuff that we do that that is secular that we. If you're going to look at those things and go cause division, really it's cause of division. We're not to be divisive amongst each other. So if somebody has liberty to celebrate Christmas with a Christmas tree, so be it. If they're not worshiping it. And I think, you know, Leviticus says, uh, Leviticus 20, 23 says, And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations, and I'm driving you out, <clears throat> out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detest them. I mean, check your own life. What, what's going on in our own life that is a custom of the nation that would be detestable to God? Is the Christmas tree one of them if we're honoring Christ in it? I doubt it. So I think it goes back to the heart of the question and causes division and, and really it doesn't mean anything, you know. So Amen. So let's move on. Yeah, so the next question was is I understand that the law was fulfilled when Jesus gave his life for us. However, we still follow parts of the law, especially those parts to do with morality or sexual purity. Why do we pick and choose what parts of the law to follow regarding sexual sin, drunkenness, etc.? How do uh, how do we know which parts still to, uh, still apply? And my answer to that is we it all of it applies. The law applies, and, and I think this is where the confusion comes. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew five seventeen, he says, "Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them." I tell you the truth: until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen. <coughs> will by many means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But those, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, here's what you need to understand. Both law and grace point to the same thing. Both law and grace point to righteousness. Uh, law shows you what righteousness looks like. The problem with law is the law can't get you there. The law was not written to be attained. Therefore, the law points you says, okay, this is what righteousness looks like. You can't get there through the law. It's, it's, the law is worthless in that point. <coughs> That's why religion is worthless. Religion is man trying to reach God. And the Bible is very clear. Man cannot reach him. But to say, to say that, the, the, that what the law points to is frivolous to the new, ki- the new covenant is to miss the point of the whole thing in the first place. Because both law and grace point to righteousness. And the difference between law and grace is grace is how we get there. Okay? And so it, it, grace doesn't do away with the law. Grace simply, simply fulfills the law. And I would argue that grace holds a higher standard than even what the law holds. That's like what when Jesus said, <coughs> you've heard it said in Matthew 5, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder or do not murder. That's the law. <laughs> Jesus says, uh-uh, I tell you the truth. The law is if you're angry with your brother, you've already broken that command. The, the, the law says if you, if you look upon a woman with a, with a lustful heart, a lustful eye, you've, you know, is, is way beyond having committed adultery. They're two different things. So you got the law, and then you have grace, which points to way beyond that. And the whole point is, when Jesus comes in our lives, he's the one that makes us righteous, not us. Amen. It's his righteousness that's lived through us. And that's why the art of this walk with Christ isn't striving for righteousness. It is living in righteousness. You cannot strive for righteousness because you can't attain it. The only way you can attain it is through the law, and the law will be- fail you every time. Therefore, <coughs> we have to step in grace and surrender, and Jesus fulfills that through us. Now, what does that mean? That simply means this. Every area of my life I've surrendered to Christ produces righteousness. That's all that means. Every area I've not surrendered to Christ produces unrighteousness. And every area of my life that is not producing righteousness is unrighteous. It's, it's under the law, and the law condemns me, and I stand condemned. But Paul said, listen, therefore, you... You who are in Christ are are set free from condemnation. There is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying, for you, when you step into grace, you are under the righteousness of him. When you live in out his righteousness in your life, there is no condemnation because you're no longer under the law. You're under grace. But grace doesn't mean you have right to sin. It just means you're able to live out the righteousness that you can't obtain in the law. And I hope that made sense. But... uh, uh, that's my. You go ahead. I know you got a. You got a lot longer than I did. Uh, explanation. No, you, you talked about a lot of it, and I think first is the, to identify. Well, what's the purpose of the law? Paul tells us in Romans seven that it's. That he says, uh, "What shall we say then? Is the law sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known what sin was." I mean, how many of us who didn't know Jesus, and then and then all of a sudden we we know come to know Christ and we start to see some of the law in the Old Testament, we're like, "Wow, I was really a sinner." <coughs> Holy cow, we just get this whole thing start to flow into us. And we understand what Paul says, I, I didn't know what coveting was until I knew thou shalt not covet. Right? And so, we're echoing in here. Oh, there was something is. on? Yeah. I know what it is. All right. It's, it's Periscope. <laughs> uh, so, um, part of that is, is, now I lost my train of thought. Wow. Okay, so, <laughs> that was a good thought. Here's the thing. It's not them. I think it goes back to the heart of the question. And I, and I really have to address the question. is Paris We don't pick and choose what the law has is. has audio up there, too. I don't. But the problem is, is we look, we think it's there's a law in all the things that were there that God used to establish Israel as a nation. Some of those don't apply to us. Some of those don't. But the heart of the law, the spiritual law, the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down, that's still oh, I don't have anything. Right and as we grow in Christ, and he t- and Jesus tells us in Matthew 17, he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And that those that would teach to to uh, not follow this will be cast out, but those that would teach it 
to follow all of it no will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Shh, you guys. Well, why is he telling us that? Because, because it's a natural outflow that you start to follow a law. Listen, how many of you who profess Christ still are liars? Full on liars. I'm even talking about like when you were unsaved, you lied just because you could lie and it was fun to lie. Do you still do that? No, why? Because the natural outpouring of who Christ is and a new creation in us, the spirit that empowers us, says that we don't do those things anymore. So by, by not us even trying to, we start to fulfill the law. Thou shalt not lie. Let, let me piggyback on that. Before, if you don't have Christ in your life, if, you, if you're living without Christ, if my life is not surrendered to Christ, then, then there's no, it's a no-brainer you're going to walk in sin. And I, 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 I laugh at the church, which looks at the world and then begins to have shock and awe about the world sinning. It's natural. Sin is natural. We're, we're outside of God. We're, we're, at, oh, op, we're, at, we're at the wrath of God. I mean, we're at the enemy. God is our enemy outside of that. Okay? We're his enemy. Okay? So we're going to sin. But here's the thing. When Christ comes in your life, and he, he, there's a transformation of a new creation... At that point, at, from a believer standpoint, it actually is, takes more energy to sin than it does to walk in righteousness. We don't think of that way. We think, oh, it's really hard to, to not do what I want to do. Well, that's sin. That's an area that's not, if, if you're really desiring to do it, there's no repentance in that area, and you're still, un, you're still unsurrendered in that area. Sure, that's where you're at. But once Christ has come in and touched an area of your life, you, look at everything you have to step over to walk in unrighteousness. You have to step over your conscience. You have to step over the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. You have to step over what you know in the Word. I mean, there is a lot of energy to step into unrighteousness. And I think from a believer's standpoint, a lot of people just say, I'm just trying to survive this walk, walk with Christ. Well, you know what? You need to get out of the driver's seat and let him take over and watch how you know what it means to be in rest in Jesus. Because if you're trying, you've missed it. You're trying to do it to the law, and it fails you. <laughs> so I, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I think it's. I think that's correct. I think part of it is is what we see is people that want to live in the law, and so they call things out that are well. You're 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 going against God's word. Well, what's going on in your life? And it really goes back to the heart of the question because I fulfilled a lot. It's it's like I've had a conversation on with program members in my house, and why do we go out and do works? Because works don't save me, right? But why do I do that? Because it's a natural outpouring of who Christ is in me. I want to I want to go out and affect the world. I want to go out and do these things. I want to go out and pour things out. And just as me fulfilling the law, I don't pick and choose it. God just starts picking and choosing what he's working on in my life. And all of a sudden he's like, I'm going to take this area that you've been struggling with and we're going to we're going to shave that off. It's gone. And then all of a sudden we're fulfilling the law in that area and we're, it's not picking and choosing. He's like, I'm polishing you. I'm refining you. And all of a sudden, we start obeying those areas, and we're like, whoa, I didn't even notice I was doing that anymore. When I was about 12 years old, I'm an only child, and I was OCD. I used to, when I was a kid, uh, every Friday night, I would come home from school, and I would actually take every piece of furniture out of my bedroom, and I would sweep or vacuum, depending on what I had, and I would clean it to, I mean, all the corners, everything there. I mean, this is how OCD I used to be. And, uh, and then I used to I'd take a piece of paper, and I'd redesign my room. And I was all, it was all, the focus was getting ready for Saturday morning cartoons, okay? And this goes back to when I was like seven, eight years old. I, I did this, and I, I, was all, I had my list of cartoons and my, my little black and white TV that I had in my room. And I, and I, I loved cleaning my room. Well, one, one weekend, my parents were gone for the day or whatever, and I think I was like 10 or so. And I had this great idea. I was going to clean our house. And we lived in a mobile home at the time, a 70-foot single wide. And I started the kitchen, and I mean, I scrubbed everything and cleaned everything through. Now, why did I do that? It was inside of me, there was a joy in it. It was just out of, I live here, and because of the favor of my life, I just want to do something out of my heart. And I had no, I, I had no idea I was setting a precedent, okay? I just thought, you know, I want to do this, and there was great joy. And you know what? I remember that day. I just had a blast dusting and and I'm not I mean it's not that I enjoy cleaning I just that day I was I was accomplishing something in my life and I got down my parents came home that night and they were like blown away and they were so blown away that guess what that all became my job that was next week now the moment yeah. they came home and determined guess what that what what I did that day was grace it was what was naturally in me and I had great joy the moment the precedent was set my parents brought law and you know what? From that day on, I hated housework. Yeah. I despised it. Yeah. And you see the difference? 
And I think most of us, when we talk about Christianity, we talk about this walk, we, the latter is what we know. I have to do this. And because of law, I have to do this. And so there's no joy in it. But when you remove the law from it, and it, it comes back to that what's in your heart, and an outflow of your heart, it be, what, what would become very detestable, maybe on one side, becomes great joy. Amen. Right. Was that good? I think that was good. All right. I just, can I say this? I would, I would have been the last person cleaning our entire house at 10 years old. <laughs> You're amazing. I, <laughs> I made up for, for, for that in other ways, you know. I just, you said 10, clean the entire house. I was like, yeah, yeah that right. Right, man. Yeah. I didn't even clean my room. I was, I was pretty much a loner, so I never had to. Are we going to address number three? Yeah, I guess we're going to go there. Just fine. You want to read it? Yeah, so, okay. All right, uh, number three is, uh, why does Discovery Fellowship believe in tithing? My understanding is that tithing is not part of the New Covenant teaching. Give, uh, giving, because we have to, is legalism, therefore part of sin and death, not grace. Giving offerings out of, the, out of love would be considered grace. Now, I'm gonna, I, I guess I'm going to drop on this first. I, I, I disagree with two parts of the question. Um, uh, there's two parts here that I just don't agree with. First is tithing is not a New Covenant teaching. I, I've heard this go around the church so much, and I, it's, it's wearing me down. It's how much, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's a heart issue, not a, not a theological issue here that this question comes into. Uh, it goes around. But the second part of this is that it has to do with legalism, and I'm sorry. Uh, it can have, to, anything can have to do with legalism, but to say that tithing, it, it really, here, here's what it comes down to, and this is where this question sits on two sides. Um, for for someone to, for me to ever get there to that point of those two points, you'd have to convince me that worship is also not relevant in the grace covenant. And, and and if you can get me to believe that worship doesn't belong in the church, worship doesn't belong in my in the new covenant of Christ, then I then I'm with you on the tithing issue. Okay, but I, I really think this really comes between religion versus worship. Um, at least legalism comes from a different place than worship does. Do you agree with me on that? Uh, it, legalism is, is, we get caught up in it, in the area of the Sabbath. And, boy, that, I've heard that go around the church, of which, you know, a Saturday, why aren't we celebrating on Saturday? And this letter of the law, and then tithing and holiness. And all, really, all of these things, when you go back to the Old Testament, all of these things had to do with one thing, and that, that was putting our trust in God. That's what it really came down to, is do I trust God with my life? Do I trust Him with my workplace? Do I trust Him with my resources, with my time? And my finances. And when, when we talk about tithing, we get caught up in semantic, semantics. <coughs> we get caught up in semantics around it. And, I, and, and people will show me the New Testament. Well, it is there. But it's, it's kind of like, it, it, it's kind of like, I, I mean, I, I, I told Mike this one time. I wish Paul would have just sat back and said, guys, let's talk about what, you know, what we already all know. And, and it was such an, and, you know, you got to understand much of the, the audience of the New Testament is who? Much of it's the Jews. Now, all of it's us, because we, we, we are grafted into the Jews. Yeah. So when we, when we have conversations in the New Testament, you have to understand, who are we talking to? We're talking to Jews. And Jews understood the law. Now, Paul does a really good job of really saying, guys, you need to get free from the law. Okay? And we're set free from the law. I agree with that. And I think tithing is something that has been abused in the church. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah. Yeah. There are many churches that have abused the area of giving and tithing, to a just grotesque point of view. I mean, I've heard of places where, where they know you know you have to be a member, you have to uh, give your, your 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 monthly income so they can determine. And I think that's hogwash. And I wouldn't go to a church like that. Um, I think I I think anybody that's sitting, sitting here for your salvation again has to do with your giving. I think you miss the point of what giving is. Now I don't struggle with the word tithing. I struggle with it less than Mike. Mike, Mike I think would probably. Probably say, hey, I just don't even want to use the word, um, and, and 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 probably because of the baggage there, and I don't want to speak for him because we, we we're not in disagreement on this. I just it's just we probably sit on two sides of this coin. Yeah. Um, but traditional or not? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm I yeah. I don't want to be told I'm traditional, but I am. Uh, uh, <laughs> I have to admit, yeah, I, I grew up in the church, so I am. There, here's let me just say this: begin all things. If you aim for nothing, you can write this down. If you aim for nothing, you will hit it every time. Is that a fair statement? If you don't set goals, you're never going anywhere. Okay? And so when we talk about the area of giving, if you have no plan in your area of giving, how many know you're not going to give? 
Let's talk about your savings. How, don't, don't respond to this, but think about this one. How many of you have savings? Now, don't, don't respond to that. No, I don't want to see hands. Just No hands. Just How many of you have savings? Now, now, you that have savings, how many of you have savings have it accidentally? You know, I, I've saved up five grand and it accidentally showed up in my account. Now, if that happened, you better talk to the bank or you might be in trouble, okay? No, savings doesn't happen. Will you agree with me? Savings doesn't happen accidentally. True. Well, I'm just gonna whatever's left over. It can, okay. What if it's passed down from like? <coughs> that's not savings. That's inheritance. What if it's in your savings? Yeah, well, it could be put in your Praise God, it got there, okay? Yeah, but it was planned. But that money was planned by somebody, wasn't it? Okay. The point is, it doesn't just happen. And if I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna save this year, but I make no plans to save, how, how, how? Potentially, how, how, how potentially is that going to happen? Not. Probably not going to happen. Well, whatever I have left over, we'll throw there. Well, I'm going I'm to live to my means. It's not going to be left over. So when we talk about giving, and we're really talking about tithing, the more important probably conversation is proportional giving. And as a believer in Scripture, is there is there are um, there are uh, laws. I, I'm not sure the word I want to use here, but there are principles. I guess that's the word I use. There is a blessing in our in our giving, but there's a blessing in our worship. And giving is a, is directly related to our worship. And there is nothing that will connect your heart to where your treasure is than your money. You want to know where your heart is? Follow your money. Right? Yeah. So you come and say, well, you know what? I'm I, I'm going to make Jesus the very first thing in my life. Show me in your money. Because I will tell you this, if he's not in your money, he's not going to be in your time, he's not going to be in your relationships, he's not going to be in your resources, he's not going to be anywhere else. Amen. And so what, when we have this conversation, understand, I don't care what God chooses to tell you you need to be faithful with. I don't believe that there's an, a, a magic number that God says, you have to give this amount for blessing. Yeah. Okay? Right. But I do believe there is an obedience and God comes to us and says, listen, will you? how much will you trust me? And one person says, God, I will trust you with 5% of my income. Watch what I will do with that. Another person comes and says, I will trust you with 10% of my income. God says, watch what I will do with that. Another person comes and says, I will trust you with 20% of my income. And God says, watch what I will do with that. Now, now we go back to the, talent, the talents, right? Yeah. And we see that God blesses and he returns uh, a thousandfold. What does it say in Luke 16? <coughs> Pressed down, shaken together, and running over in your return. And so, um, so I really believe when we talk about tithing, we're really dealing with generosity. And that's where Mike and I, we come in alignment in this. And we're dealing with what has God led you to do? And is God leading you to do more? And if you have no plan, you're probably doing nothing. But if you have a plan and you see God's faithfulness, what's that going to encourage you to do? More. Yeah. To give more and to be more invested in the kingdom. And I and I, I just want to say, if Jesus is number one in your life, he's going to be number one in everything. He's going to be number one in your relationships. He's going to be number And I can take any one of those things and calculate that out over the orb of your life. And it's, it's going to be consistent. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Paul says that he's a cheerful giver. So if you're cheerful about giving, then you're going to be generous. Then you're going to have everything that you're going to need to survive anyway. But he loves a cheerful giver. <coughs> Yeah, uh, that's what Paul said. Paul, Paul also says that we need to uh, set at the beginning of the week uh, for uh, a gift so that he doesn't have to do a collection. Yeah. So part of it is, is we look at that and we say, okay, so there's a plan, there's there's those things. I, what I reference it for, so so tithes and offerings. And I go, and there's, you know, there's a lot of passions we go to. I've got a ton of stuff in there. I mean, really, we look at the beginning of Genesis. What happens? We get Genesis 4.2. It says that the king and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. Were they commanded to? No, this is faith. They brought an offering to the Lord. The offering is a present. It's a thanksgiving offering. Give it to the Lord. We get to Abraham and he gives an offering to Melchizedek. It's a tenth of what, and that's where we get tithed out of, right? right. A tenth of his spoils of war. He wasn't required to do that. He did it as an offering. Right. And then so God uh, says that the nation of Israel is his children. The best way to teach children is what? Repetitive things. Yeah. Right? Over and over again, you're going to give a tithe, you're going to give a tithe, you're going to give a tithe. Why? Because he wanted them to continue to have a generous heart. But they went overboard in it. And so when we get to the New Testament and everybody's all upset over tithes and offerings, right? and I know it's not asking about tithes and offerings, but it's he's, Jesus being asked, should we pay taxes? 
And he gets the coin, and what does he say? He tells them in, in Matthew uh, 22, 21, he says, uh, they said, uh, Jesus asked what's on the coin, and he said, uh, they said, Caesar. Then he said, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and then to God the things that are God's. Right? Amen. So he's telling us, pay your taxes, pay your bills, those things that are like that, right? But what's God's? Everything. Amen. There's not a thing that's created. The word says, all things were created by him and for him. <coughs> Through him. There's nothing that we have. Even the inventions that we have are not ours. They're his. So all things belong to God. So if we're giving to God and attempting to outgive him, we can't. But it's about a generous heart. It goes back to the whole part of it is, is how can I how can I step into what my Father in heaven has poured out, right? He pours out so much in us. Just think in your own life and go. Wow, he's, he's been faithful here. And I'm not just talking about finances. Think of other things. Start to think of the things that he's poured into in your life. The times that you asked him for, for prayer and he's answered like that. Or even if he's not, anytime he's answered. Our salvation is a gift that we cannot give back, right? Yeah, tithe was not based upon the law because tithe started before the law. Tithe was based one. upon love because he so loved God and what God had done in his life that Abraham. he chose to give a yeah. tax. Tithe is all about love. It is nothing about law. Correct, but tithe is in the law, and they they yeah. took it far. It and so, so what's what's happened here in the church? Yeah, what's happened? Yeah, what's happened in the church though <laughs> is there's been abuse in it, yeah, and so true. people are like, and here's what the other part of it is. I think, and again, I'm in agreement with Pastor is if you've got issues with giving to God, you've got bigger issues indeed. Yeah, you're back to not following the shit. You've got, you've got so, you, you're, you're, you're going, well, I don't, you can, and so there's this book, it's called um, uh, um, Women Are Like Spaghetti and Men Are Like Waffles, right? And so what 